Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Wood, uh, founder and CIO of ARK Invest, and it's Employment Friday. Uh, so here I am again. Uh, we're going to go through fiscal policy, monetary policy, but we're going to change it up a little bit uh, this time. We're going to introduce, alongside monetary policy, market indicators. What are, what are the indicators saying out there? Uh, then economic statistics, particularly those since, uh, uh, well, for April, uh, because we think uh, everything changed with the bank crisis in March, and that bank crisis has not ended, and we don't see it ending for quite some time. And then finally, a few thoughts on artificial intelligence and uh, electric vehicles uh, in the innovation space at the end. Okay, fiscal policy. So... Uh, this week, uh, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, came out and said that she thinks that the government will run out of money to pay bills by June. Uh, and so uh, many people thought it would last through August, um, but apparently tax revenues uh, are not coming in as um, as high as they thought. And so uh, the deadline is now moved from what many people thought could be August, September uh, to June 1st. So this is uh, all about the debt ceiling debate. And uh, we know there is a big divide uh, between the president's proposed budget and uh, what the House is coming up with. Um, and uh, they do not seem to be talking to one another or with one another. Uh, so again, we look at this as unfortunate, but it is short term. We know they're going to raise the debt ceiling. I think they've raised it uh, every year except two, I believe. Um, and uh, the political stakes are pretty high. We are entering into an election year. We've got uh, uh, politicians throwing their hats into the ring, uh, which makes that ever so real for those who have to vote. Uh, so we think they'll figure it out. Um, I don't know if there will be a technical default or not, but they're going to figure, out, figure it out. The debt ceiling will increase. And uh, the question is, will they come up with a budget uh, at any point in the near future? The one thing I wanted to focus on in, in terms of fiscal policy and all of the government spending that has been spewing out uh, since the, the beginning of COVID is that it seems like uh, government spending is beginning to crowd out the private sector. And what I mean by that, this is uh, related to the banking crisis, actually. Um, if you look at where what people are doing with their money as they leave banks, they're going into treasury securities for the most part and money market funds, safety. And um, it, it is interesting that they think they're lowering their risk by leaving the banking system and increasing their returns uh, by going into treasuries. That's not the way the world is supposed to work. Uh, you usually increase your returns as you're increasing risk. Uh, so the incentive to do it, given the bank failures that uh, seem to be uh, occurring regularly nowadays, um, uh, the, the sensible thing to do is to go for the higher return and the lower risk. Um, now, what I mean by crowding out is, and this was really a concept that uh, came out of the 70s and early 80s, uh, Henry Kaufman and Al Wojnarowski were the two economists who who really focused investors on this thought that uh, you know the the government was uh, from a funding point of view uh, taking uh, taking away uh, opportunities from the private sector, and that is what's going on. Why is that? It's going on this time uh, because deposits in a banking system can be turned around into making loans. Uh, but funds flowing into money market funds uh, backed by the government um, 
treasury, treasury securities, uh, those can't do anything. They can't be repurposed. Uh, and so that's what I mean by crowding out. Um, so on to monetary policy and market indicators. Uh, well, this week, uh, the Fed did increase the Fed funds rate Again, 25 basis points. We're now at 5.25, 21 times uh, where we were a little more than a year ago. So a 21-fold increase in interest rates from 25 basis points to 5.25. <clears throat> now, um, never has the Fed raised rates in the middle of a crisis. Uh, and, and they do seem still to be separating or, or compartmentalizing what's going on. We have the tools to deal with a crisis, and we're doing that. And uh, we need to fight inflation as, right now, a primary goal of monetary policy. Um, now, I listened to Jay Powell's uh, talk, presentation, and his uh, Q&A session, and not once did, uh, did the concept of money supply come up. Uh, so it is interesting to note that uh, M2 is accelerating to the downside. M2 in the month of March was down 4.1% on a year-over-year -year basis. And um, we think it'll be down 5% or more in April. Uh, if you look at the first quarter and annualize it, so from December to March, and then annualize it, uh, money supply declined uh, by 6.7%. If you look at March alone, and of course that's when the bank crisis started, uh, and you annualize that, uh, money supply declined at a 14%. 14.7% annualized rate. I want to make sure that you understand that concept. It's taking that one month percent change and effectively multiplying it by 12. Um, so M M2 growth, growth rates are accelerating to the downside. Um, and we've never seen a swing in money supply um, like this one, we've gone from 27% 20, increase in February of 21 to now minus 4.1%. Uh, so that's a 31 percentage point um, turnaround. And uh, one of the things that puzzles us is that the Fed is not talking about money supply. If you, if you think about the Fed, the makeup of the Fed, uh, I don't think any one of them has been involved in the financial markets. Neil Kashkari at the Minneapolis Fed was at Goldman for a while and PIMCO for a while. Um, but uh, the way I understood uh, his role, uh, roles, uh, he was more of a, a relationship builder. I don't think he was watching market signals on a, as far as a day-to-day -day job. Uh, so I understand that they probably don't respect market signals uh, the way we in the market think they should respect them. But they should, they should respect economic signals. And uh, if you look at uh, the the basic identity that everyone learns in Macroeconomics 101, it is MV equals PQ. I know I went through this on, on the last um, uh, the last in the know, but I, I think it's important to repeat and to keep bringing this to people's attention. MV equals PQ. It's an identity. They have to equal. PQ is nominal GDP growth. And uh, it was in the six, I believe, six to 7% range on a year over year basis in the first quarter. So um, that's nominal GB, G, GB, <laughs> you know, between chat GPT and GDP, I'm getting uh, twisted here, but 
That's nominal GDP growth. So six to seven percent. On the other side is money. And I just mentioned that in March, money was down 4% on a year-over-year basis. For the quarter, it was probably down closer to 2%. So minus 2% on this side. Uh, but we have to get uh, the identity up to what we already know is, let's just say, 7%. So if it's minus 2 on this side, and this is 7%, we have to fill the hole. And how do we do that? It's with velocity. Velocity is the rate at which money change. It turns over in, in, in the markets. Uh, so velocity must have increased roughly 9% in the first quarter. And so it, it's doing what it usually does after a crisis. It's trying to get back to the actual downtrend that's been in place since 1997. And it didn't get back there yet. And we do not believe it will get back there. The reason is the banking crisis. During a crisis, velocity usually slows down. The rate of increase slows down, um, flattens out, and actually goes down. During, during COVID, velocity uh, collapsed. Uh, and so we don't think it's going to collapse. But even if it simply flattens out, uh, on a year-over-year -year basis during the next few quarters, um, money growth is unlikely to turn around given what the Fed policy is doing. And I just mentioned it's accelerating to the downside, um, exacerbated, of course, by deposits leaving the system. Now, I think the Fed has something like 200 PhD economists and uh, one would think that macroeconomics 101 uh, might be a consideration in the policy discussions and in the um, minutes of the Fed meetings and in the speeches that uh, Chairman Powell and others give. Um, we don't hear it at all. So, um, but I think market signals are going to force, force this topic upon the Fed. So let's talk about market signals. Um, the yield curve, the yield curve is still inverted. Now it's not inverted as much as it was before the crisis. Before the banking crisis, uh, the week before, the yield curve was inverted by 100 basis points. That means that long rates were 101% uh, below short rates. Long is measured by the 10-year Treasury bond yield and short as measured by the two-year Treasury bond yield. Um, the banking With the banking crisis, uh, actually short rates adjusted more than long rates in terms of flattening out the yield curve uh, a bit. Uh, we're down to roughly 45, 48 basis points. So it's been cut in half. But long rates haven't moved much since the crisis. So that adjustment has uh, taken place uh, mostly by short rates. Well, the Fed has just telegraphed that it doesn't want short rates to do that. It wants short rates to go higher, uh, at least uh, at this point in time, and they'll keep an open mind going forward. That is a little bit of a change, and so that's good. Um, so that's one market signal. And typically the yield curve... If it's inverted, is pointing to uh, much lower than expected growth. Um, and actually, every time in post World War II experience that the Fed, that the yield curve has inverted, and it inverted way back in July of last year, the economy has entered a, a recession. Um, the second is an, the second market indicator is also in the fixed income markets. So credit default swaps. Um, you know, I'm looking at the banks, uh, money center banks, uh, as well as the regional banks. Um, the the money center bank credit default swaps have been moving up. And what are credit default swaps? They are hedges against the risk of bankruptcy. Uh, so they're protection, they're insurance policies. And people, buy, uh, when the risks are going up, the price of these insurance policies 
uh, is going up. And that is what is happening now. And it happened for most of last year, as a matter of fact, after uh, a quiet period in, in 2021. Um, I'm not going to name the banks because I don't want to uh, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular. Uh, but money center banks are a representative one here. If you looked at the price of the credit default swaps pre-COVID, they were in the uh, let's just say thirty to fifty uh, thirty to fifty range. Um, if you look at if you looked at them at the peak of the COVID crisis, when you know we were worried uh, about a depression, uh, they peaked, uh, let's say, in the one seventy five to two hundred range. So that was quite a big increase. Uh, but then they settled back down in twenty twenty one, back into that. It was more like a 40 to 60 range. And now what we find is they have, uh, they have doubled or tripled from there. So uh, they're not quite up to where they were during the COVID peak, uh, but, but they're getting there. Uh, they're more than halfway there. Uh, so that is saying that even the big money center banks, which are uh, the st systemically important banks, the SIBs, um, are seeing this kind of uh, insurance policy taken out. Um, now, why would that be? Well, first of all, we are seeing a continuation of bank failures. And, uh, and, and what's a little troubling about this is uh, that the, the administration seems to be I'm not going to say wanting it to happen. I'm sure it doesn't want it to happen. But what 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 the uh, administration is saying is, hey, banks that made bad decisions, you know, shareholders will be wiped out. Uh, President Biden said that uh, when he addressed the nation, I think it was on March 13th. Uh, and bondholders will be hurt as well. So um, this is what I mean by, you know, not paying attention to market signals. Well, if you have uh, investors fleeing banks, uh, this is going to cause the bank prices to go down. And that's exactly what's happened. The uh, KRE, which is a regional bank index, uh, it in February of 22, uh, the index, so it's a, a stock price index. It was, this was before the Fed started tightening. It was at 79. Um, and uh, today it's at 38. And it's broken um, some of the technical supports that I think investors were uh, depending on. At the COVID low, it was 27. And at the 09 low, it was 14. Uh, so it's it's broken down and it's heading for the COVID low. Um, what is the incentive for uh, investors to move uh, funds into banks when they're seeing deposit outflows, uh, uh, at, which may be accelerating for all we know? We know money growth um, is coming down at an accelerated rate and demand deposits are the biggest part of money growth. Um Fed has just raised rates. That's another incentive to move away from these banks that are somewhat hamstrung in terms of competing with money market funds uh, because during COVID, they made two uh, mistaken assumptions. And I'm going to, uh, unlike a lot of people, I'm, I'm going to say those assumptions were understandable. And I wish that the administration would um, focus on that instead of uh, making these uh, banks, bank management uh, teams out to be, you know, really stupid um, and, and uh, irresponsible almost. Uh, the two assumptions were, and this was in the heat of the COVID crisis, when deposits associated with stimulus payments were flying into the banks. Their deposits were 
increasing at a very rapid rate, and they and they needed to decide what to do with that money. Uh, do they buy securities? No one was taking out loans back then, and they didn't really want to give loans because it seemed like a very risky thing to do. And they looked at the Fed's forecast to the end of this year, 2023, and saw that the Fed agreed that uh, we were going to be in um, in harm's way for quite a while because of COVID, uh, and their own forecasts were for short-term interest rates to be in the 0.2% range by the end of 2023. So these bank management teams did what they thought at the time was the prudent thing to do, and that was buy securities uh, and label them hold to maturity. So they bought government-backed securities. They, They bought safe securities and put them into a category called held to maturity or hold to maturity. They were yielding 1.5% in the in the one and a half percent range. Well, if you thought short rates were going to be 0.2% by now, that uh, that would be a nice spread. You know, that that was a decent yield. Um, so that was the first mistake, not assuming that the Fed would raise interest rates 21 fold within a a couple of years time. And the reason they made that assumption is because it has never happened before. Uh, Even in the early 80s, when Volcker was trying to strangle inflation out of the system, interest rates went up twofold from 10 to 20%, not 21 fold. Uh, And expectations for low interest rates for longer Uh, That has been the going assumption for the last 12, 13 years, 14 years since the 08, 09 crisis. Uh, So you can understand why they made that decision. The the second uh, mistaken assumption, also understandable, was that deposits would not leave the system. And, uh, And that's because deposits generally don't leave the system uh, over history, they've been going up over time. In fact, the only time M2 has declined on a year-over-year basis ever has been, uh, was during the 1930s, the Depression. Deposits have had an occasional dip below uh, zero, but quickly reversed. Um, we're not seeing that this time. Uh, and again, it, it has never happened since the Great Depression. And so you can understand why management teams said, said at the time, well, even if we're buying these securities at one and a half percent yields, um, other deposits will come in over time and we'll buy uh, treasuries at higher and higher yields. Uh, and, uh, and so you can understand what happened. Um, the regional bank uh, index is breaking down. I think there that investors are concerned about how this administration and the Fed uh, is is treating uh, them. Uh, again, the the Fed doesn't seem to be taking any blame for what's happening to the regional banks, uh, but we believe it deserves a lot of, of blame, and that's because interest rates are up twenty one fold. Um, and then we've got Bitcoin. And, you know, I think the shock of all shocks to those who have uh, do not believe in Bitcoin or think it's a Ponzi scheme or, uh, you know, are blockchain, not Bitcoin uh, in their focus. uh, They're shocked that interest that the Bitcoin has gone from 19,000 during the heat of the bank crisis in uh, that second week of March uh, to 29,000. Uh, it's a flight to safety. That's what this is. It's a flight to safety. And those who understand the value of Bitcoin as uh, really the Bitcoin blockchain evolving a new global monetary system that is not hostage to any human decision makers uh, is decentralized, transparent, auditable, uh, more and more people want that. And, you know, this is proof of concept. Uh, Bitcoin 
came out of the ashes of 0809. Um, and uh, basically, um, the, it was designed, decentralized, transparent, auditable, as an antidote, uh, a place, uh, again, to go, a monetary system to which uh, investors can flee. And uh, that's exactly what's going on. This move from 19 to 29 was not a flash in the pan. We are still there. And if you look at our Bitcoin monthly, it just came out this week, a couple of days ago, you'll see that the signals, we measure the health of the Bitcoin blockchain in that piece. And you can see the health on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's very, very healthy. And then there's another market indicator um, it's away from fixed income and, and digital assets. It's commodity prices. Um, all of the prices I usually cite are down uh, uh, from their peaks, and all but gold and silver are down on a year-over-year -year basis. And we're watching gold very carefully. It, like Bitcoin, and to some extent silver as well, our flights to safety if people don't trust the banking system. Um, uh, but we also have to be mindful that gold is a very good inflation gauge. It peaked in August of 2020, and it's still in the range that has been in place since then. Um, uh, but we're paying close attention. Is it rising? Is the price rising because of a flight to safety? We would suggest so. But there's always that risk that gold is picking up on fears also that the, the Fed, those who don't believe the Fed should ease, and we're not in that category, but there are many people out there and who worry that the Fed will pivot, uh, might be hedging that possibility uh, with, with gold. Um, the most visible uh, commodity price is oil. We pass gas stations, so oil, um, gasoline, we pass gas sta stations continuously on, on our drives. And so it is interesting to note that after Russia invaded Ukraine, the oil price spiked to $130 per barrel and has not seen that price since. Um, today it's at 70 and now the 200-week moving average, now for some reason, 200-week is like a four-year moving average. For some reason, you know, when prices hit that level, they tend to find uh, major support. Um, I know that our first Bitcoin purchase was when uh, Bitcoin hit its 200-week moving average at $250. Today, it's $29,000. Uh, and that was a very good place to buy it. Well, oil broke through that level this week. Uh, that that level was uh, or is sixty seven dollars, and I believe it it cracked to sixty five, maybe it, it even a little lower. What's also interesting about what's happening to oil now is if you adjust the oil price uh, from the point it had quadrupled after the oil embargo, and that was in 1975. If you adjust that price forward uh, to today, so back then it was um, in the $12, $12 range, adjust that for overall inflation, not oil inflation, but overall inflation. And what you'll find is that today's price um, Seventy dollars, and as I mentioned, it hit sixty-five earlier, is below the price in real terms uh, that we saw back then. Uh, now think about how the Middle East has evolved and how much um, how much uh, uh, wealthier uh, and how uh, the Middle East is, and how much lifestyles have improved and and the economic lot of the region. And you juxtapose that against this notion that, wait a minute, in real terms, the price today is lower than it was back then. And you begin to think, wow, if this price keeps going down, what is going to happen to the Middle East? 
Now, why is it going down? Uh, it, it, it's for any of a number of reasons. Maybe we're in the middle of a hard landing here in the U.S., which is what MV equals PQ is beginning to suggest. Uh, maybe something's not right in China as it's uh, rebounded from zero COVID. Um, we are. We saw Estee Lauder's report. A number of companies are saying, well, okay, yeah, we saw a bounce, uh, uh, but it hasn't been sustained in China. And uh, Estee Lauder's price, stock price went down the most it ever has in, uh, in history, in its stock price history. Uh, so that's a possibility. Demand destruction is another. Electric vehicles. Um, we're seeing an accelerated shift towards electric vehicles from internal combustion engine powered cars. And even more important, we're seeing Hertz buying more and more electric vehicles for its fleet because the maintenance costs associated with EVs are 50 to 60% lower than those for um, gas-powered vehicles. Uh, so if Hertz is moving, then uh, the number of vehicle electric vehicle miles traveled is growing at a much faster rate than just this uh, uh, accelerated shift to uh, to electric vehicles, so that's a possibility, and uh, it can it what 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 might happen here, and we want to prepare everyone for it and ourselves for it, is if if that last point is true, and uh, energy companies begin to think that this price is not going to go to a higher high, uh, or even very much higher for very long, we'll see them pull investments out, continuing to pull investments out of the ecosystem. And we'll see great volatility in the oil price. Uh, the volatility will be lower highs and lower lows, but it will be volatile. And uh, we just hope that the Fed uh, doesn't misconstrue that for an inflation signal. It's simply pulling investments out. Okay, I'm going to get to economics. Most economic statistics to us pre-March, meaning uh, they, they, they perhaps were, the, the March numbers were reported in April. They may not mean too much now because of this banking crisis. So we're trying to pay more attention to what we know about April. And of course, today's the employment, uh, employment report. And we saw uh, the unemployment rate drop to 3.4%. Uh, that ties uh, recent history for a low. You have to go back to the 60s, 70s to see lower. And, you know, that's why a lot of people, and I think Powell and many on the Fed included, think we, we risk a 70s style inflation. Um, we don't agree with that at all. Uh, I've said many times the 70s inflation started in 1964, so it built over 15 years before Volcker tackled it. This inflation, we think, is supply shock driven uh, from COVID and the, the Russian, uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so we take issue with that. Uh, so the employment itself, non-farm uh, employment, came out uh, higher than expected, 253,000. Expectation was 185,000. But we're learning something very important from these reports. Downward revisions to previous months, which always happens at turning points. So last month when uh, I, I was giving this presentation, uh, we thought that employment had increased in March uh, by 236,000. Uh, it turns out, after this first revision, that the actual increase was only 165. Now think about how differently the markets would have responded if we got that number. And it may be revised down uh, again. We get a lot of downward revisions at turning points. And in fact, we've gotten 150, or exactly 149,000 uh, jobs revised down just from this one report. Uh, so, 
employment's a lagging indicator on top of all of this. So I don't know why we spend so much time on it, except that the Fed's spending time on it. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, the reason this time it might be even more of a lagging indicator than it is normally is because of the massive shortages that we've suffered through because of COVID. And therefore, the decision on the part of companies just to stick with workers, even if at the margin business is slowing down because they don't want to, if they're wrong and business doesn't continue slowing down, they'll have to go out and, you know, rehire people. And it's been so hard. Uh, now, we're getting um, other indicators from employment uh, that it's fraying at the edges. Initial unemployment claim, insurance claims, on April 1st, uh, there was a huge revision. Again, the bank crisis had happened, and uh, I think the, the government, uh, uh, those collecting data for the government um, are, are adjusting to that. So... Uh, while we thought claims uh, were at 198,000 for the week ended April 1st, uh, it turns out that they were more like 246,000. That's a 24% increase. Uh, uh, as far as jolts, the job openings, we're see we've seen a 20% drop in the number of job openings from roughly 12 million in March of 22, that's when the Fed started tightening, to 9.6. Uh, we're also seeing continued layoffs. I think the latest uh, uh, challenger survey said that uh, job layoffs in corporate America were up, I think it was in the 170% range on a year over year basis. Now, the Fed is also focused on another lagging indicator, average hourly earnings. Uh, that was another uh, positive uh, or upward surprise. It's negative for the Fed. They don't want that. So 0 0.5 versus 0 0.3 expected. So on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, average hourly earnings are up 4.4%, uh, not 4.2%. Here is where we come into uh, another concept that is going to throw off statistics, and it is, are we measuring the economy correctly? We do not believe we are, and we believe that uh, productivity is mismeasured, um, uh, and we're going to be putting out a, a, a convergence report and getting into that um, uh, later this year. So... Uh, if productivity is up 2 to 4%, which we think it easily could be, just think about what ChatGPT is doing. Just use your imagination. And, and then 4.2% um, average hourly earnings is not inflationary. So, And it gets us within our 2%, the Fed's 2% desired range. So how that works is wages up, 4.4%. And if productivity is up, let's just say 3%, then uh, you subtract productivity from that 4%, 4.4%, and you've got roughly 1.5% underlying inflation. Um, let's see, I just rattle through a few upside and downside statistics from the last month. The biggest upside surprise, I would say, was auto sales. And uh, the expectation was that they would be up 14.8 uh, million units. And um, the, the actual was 15.9. So uh, the, the, what we are wondering is the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, sell into dealers. And uh, we're wondering how much of um, the, the auto sales, the upside surprise, uh, was catch up. People had been waiting and uh, they finally got their cars after big supply chain problems. And how much is going into dealer inventory? Uh, and, and we'll find that out uh, uh, in the not too distant future. Um, 
On the downside, uh, retail sales consumption so ended, uh, they were quite punk uh, at the end of uh, the quarter, which is the base for this quarter, um, and end of the first quarter, which is the base for this quarter. Uh, they were negative. They were significantly negative in real terms. And we get readings from the different Federal Reserve districts. So the Philadelphia Fed, Kansas, Dallas, Richmond, all showing big negatives in those districts. Um, you know, we look at the auto sales juxtaposed against Tesla's decision to cut auto prices. Um, you know, he's cutting them and raising them and I think, uh, you know, throwing, throwing a lot of people off. Many people assume Tesla is cutting prices because demand is weak. And it might be. You know, after a bank crisis, uh, everybody sits back and, you know, says, wait a minute, what's going on? Velocity of money starts to slow down quite dramatically. And Tesla told us on, on its last uh, earnings call that it is going to price so that it can keep its production lines full. And it can afford to lower prices because even at these lower prices, its margins are much higher than Ford's and higher than GM's, even after these price cuts. Uh, and one of the reasons it can continue to lower prices is it's riding down the cost curve of um, uh, electric drive train technology. And for every cumulative doubling in the number of units produced, costs decline by a 28% rate. Um, the gas-powered vehicles are so mature, they're not riding any, down any technology cost curve anymore. So they can't afford to do that with their uh, existing um, gas-powered vehicles. And at the margin, this is going to put them under a lot of pressure because Tesla will keep uh, lowering prices to below uh, gas-powered vehicles. It's just going to be very, very difficult. Um, I'm going to end now on innovation. And I think uh, I just left off there on on Tesla, it was very interesting uh, to listen to the Ford uh, conference call, earnings call, and to effectively, I think they broke out for the first time, uh, how much they were losing in electric vehicle, oh, expect to lose this year in electric vehicles. So $3 billion. And uh, this is uh, uh, EBITDA. So they expect a negative EBITDA of $3 billion um, for their internal combustion engine cars, so the blue line, uh, they expect uh, to earn, earn or positive EBITDA of $7 billion. And from their pro line, it's their trucks primarily, uh, $6 billion. That's their expectation for this year. Uh, in our brainstorm today, we uh, one, of, uh, one of the people contributing to it today said effectively, or no, this was Sam Corus, our very own um, EV analyst. He said, so effectively, they are outsourcing their corporate strategy to shareholders. They've given them these numbers. And what do these numbers say? And what did they intimate on this call? Um, they say, you know what? You should just keep uh, your focus on the internal combustion engine part of your market. It's much more profitable. And they also said they are intent on producing electric vehicles profitably. That's their primary focus. Well, I've just told you what Tesla is doing. It's going to be impossible for them to do that. And so effectively, the more short-term oriented shareholders among, uh, uh, along, uh, among Ford's shareholder base will be telling them, stop. Uh, and we think, of course, that's absolutely the wrong decision. Uh, they have no choice but to continue to move in this direction and in the autonomous direction. Otherwise, they will go out of business. Uh, so, so that was um, very interesting. And the other uh, interesting um, notes from today's brainstorm and recent brainstorms has been how... Uh, the large language models, OpenAI, 
um, uh, Llama from Meta Platforms, it seems like uh, they're going to um, they're going to be subjected to commoditization very quickly. We're seeing uh, academic research wants to keep th these models open. Um, and we're seeing uh, even open AI, they're charging now. Um, uh, we're seeing resistance to that and others shifting to, you know, models uh, that are, are from a competitive point of view coming quick, fast and furiously uh, so, as they, so they don't have to pay. There was an analogy to the cloud. We had a debate about this today. And of course, AWS in 2006 um, uh, had uh, launched, uh, launched what now people call the cloud. Uh, so Amazon did that. And for years, no one really went after them. It's quite the opposite this time around. Uh, so that's how they developed such a moat uh, uh, because it took others a long time. And now we're seeing margins starting to come down because Azure has gotten more uh, competitive and Google as well. So Google's been losing money until, until the last quarter in the cloud. So we think that's going to become much more commoditized and that AI and the large language models uh, are akin to that. But, but because so many, so much capital is chasing this opportunity, unlike the cloud in the day, uh, that commoditization cycle could happen a lot more quickly. And we're back to exactly where we thought this was going to end. Uh, and again, still lots of debate going on, uh, but the, the companies uh, harnessing AI, so it is the users who are going to be the biggest beneficiaries in terms of uh, very rapid productivity increases. Uh, uh, those that have the most sophisticated domain expertise, uh, the best AI expertise, and critically, proprietary data, data that no one else has, those will be the winners. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you want to learn more about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we just published a, a podcast with James Wang. Many of you may remember that James was our first AI analyst uh, and has gone uh, back into industry. Um, he uh, and our analysts put out the podcast called Current State of AI, uh, which I think you'll like very much. And it is also interesting to note, you know, there's a writer's strike going on in, in uh, Los Angeles and elsewhere. Um, and why is that? They're seeking job security and they don't want artificial intelligence to usurp their jobs. Um, and I, uh, any of you who have experimented with uh, chat GPT understand that their jobs are at risk uh, and that those remaining will be, you know, the best and will be overseeing a lot of AI. So um, it's very interesting also to have watched uh, Chegg. Uh, it's uh, involved in education. Uh, basically, it's a, it, it, you ask it questions and it will answer your questions if you're doing your homework or whatever. Uh, well, AI, ChatGPT is going to do that. That stock fell apart, cut, cut almost in half. IBM is saying, we're not going to hire any back office wor workers this year uh, because we can see AI driving huge productivity gains. Uh, so... Uh, this is a very big moment, and uh, it's critical that we watch our companies. And if you look at our portfolios, those companies have proprietary data that no one else has. And uh, we think that they have the technological sophistication and the domain expertise to capitalize on that data in a way that no one else can. So with that, I'll leave you now, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, and hope your spring uh, continues to flourish. All right, thank you.